On November 8, 1965, a 52-year-old woman was found dead in her Manhattan townhouse. Between the time her body was discovered and about six hours later, FBI agents swarmed that townhouse and took all of her documents, all of her files, everything they could find. Quickly, an autopsy was performed with the conclusion that this woman died of a combination of barbiturates and alcohol, circumstances undetermined. Despite that confusing message, there was no investigation. None of her colleagues, uh, none of her uh, people that knew her, none of her family, nobody that knew this particular woman stood up for her and said that's not what would have happened here. More than 10,000 people went to her funeral, weeping over the loss. And this woman was buried, and for 55 years, almost 55 years, she was ignored, she disappeared. That is until now. The name of that woman was Dorothy May Kilgallen. And as you will learn, she was murdered. And for 53 years, she has been denied the, the justice she deserves. Time now for everybody's favorite guessing game, What My Line. First, the popular columnist whose voice of Broadway appears in papers from coast to coast, Miss Dorothy Kilgallen. Okay, how many people remember Dorothy Kilgallen from What's My Line? There must be somebody out there who doesn't. Well, you know, that's exactly uh, where I stood. That's all I knew about her. That's all I knew about her, What's My Line? Well, now I've written two books about her, The Reporter Who Knew Too Much and Denial of Justice. Let me explain, too. This is my fourth book about the assassinations. The first one had to do with this guy, Melvin Belli. How many of you remember Melvin Belli? All right, well, I knew Mr. Belli in the 1980s in San Francisco. I practiced law in his building. I got to know him, quite a character. As you know, he represented Jack Ruby. And when Belli died in 1996, I decided to write a biography of him because I looked at two autobiographies he had written, and they conflicted. Now think about that a minute. But that was Belli. What was most interesting to me was Belli's representation of Jack Ruby. I never bought that psychomotor epilepsy insanity defense. For God's sakes, it made no sense, and you're going to hear more about that tonight because it didn't make any sense. But more than that, too, about Belli's affiliation with the Mafia. He loved the Mafia, one guy told me, and the Mafia loved him. His main client was Mickey Cohen, who was a Los Angeles gangster. He loved to be around him and have people think that he was a mobster. So I finished that book, and while I was looking at that, I'm a former criminal defense lawyer, and I've analyzed cases uh, on television and so on and so forth, and I always looked at motive. And I always wondered about his representation of Jack Ruby and what that had to do with the 1960 election when Joe Kennedy double-crossed those mafioso who had helped them win the presidency. Joe told them, hey, you help us win Illinois and West Virginia, and we'll leave you alone. Right away, what did he do? He appointed Bobby Kennedy attorney general, and Bobby Kennedy went after those guys, didn't he? Well, I wrote a book called The Poison Patriarch, how the betrayals of Joseph P. Kennedy caused the assassination of JFK, and I looked at the assassination, I believe, differently than anybody ever did. I looked at why Bobby Kennedy wasn't killed instead of why Jack Kennedy was. That changes everything. Bill Alexander, who prosecuted Jack Ruby uh, when I interviewed him, said to me, well, you know, Bobby Kennedy had a lot more enemies than Jack did. So I looked at it that way. I wrote about Joe, and I did all that. And I was done. Well, I just have read three biographies this year. Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and Einstein. I hope by reading those I would get a lot smarter. But what I found out in there is each of those three men had one thing in common, curiosity. And I believe through writing all of my books and what I've done in my life, I'm a curious person. Well, while I was interviewing people for the Jack Ruby, uh, excuse me, the Melvin Belli book, I ran into a doctor in San Diego. And I started talking to him about Belli, and he gave me some good facts and things. And then he said, you know, Mark, by the way, uh, he knew Dorothy Kilgallen. 
And I said, well, what, he was on What's My Line? He said, no, you don't know anything about her. Dorothy Kilgallen, yes, she was on What's My Line. She was the smart one on the end down there who guessed the occupations of people more than anybody else, right? But also she was syndicated in 200 newspapers across the country, the Hearst chain, Voice of Broadway, articles, everything. And this is actually back when, remember, when they actually read a newspaper. She had a radio show with her husband, listened to by one million people a day in New York, and she covered, as an investigative reporter, some of the most famous trials of the, 19, uh, of the uh, 20th century. Lindbergh baby kidnapping case, all right? Uh, Dr. Sam Shepard, I'm gonna show you a photograph of Dorothy in the courtroom at the Dr. Sam Shepard case, and he said, the Jack Ruby trial. Well, that really kept in my mind. I kept thinking about that, and I decided that I would start to look into Dorothy Kilgallen and see what I could find, and I'm gonna take you tonight on the same journey that I took to learn about Dorothy, ascending from a college dropout to what the New York Post called the most powerful female voice in America that Ernest Hemingway said was the greatest female writer in the world. It's a great, inspiring story, and I'm pleased to say that the Reporter Who Knew Too Much has become a, a, a bestseller, gonna make a film out of it, it looks like, and all of that, and people around the world I've heard from who are inspired by this woman's story. It's an amazing one. But let's look at what's my line, okay? Well, I'm sure you can all name who's there. Bennett Cerf, Arlene Francis, right? And the host was? John Daly, of course. Well, you know, she, uh, she was kind of the hard edge one, wasn't she? I don't know if she was your favorite or not. I don't remember watching it too much. But it was an intellectual quiz show. Kind of wish we had something like that today. But Dorothy was smart, and she would guess the occupations of people more than anybody else. So I started looking into more into Dorothy, and the evidence tonight, some of it will be evidence that's never been presented before. So here's, here's her, her column, The Voice of Broadway. I don't know if you ever read it. It was mostly... Uh, you know, as I say, in those, uh, those local newspapers in the cities across the country. Well, uh, she was a Pulitzer Prize nominated writer, and if I could write even half as well as Dorothy Kilgallen did, I'd have 25 bestsellers. Uh, if you get a chance, go to the DorothyKilgallenStory.org. Look at her columns she wrote that we'll talk about. Uh, you'll read some of her writings in both Denial of Justice and The Reporter Who Knew Too Much. What a gifted wordsmith, and you're going to hear some of that, especially when she describes Jack Ruby. All right, um, voice of Broadway and everything. 35-year career uh, called the most, foul, uh, most powerful female voice in America. All right, here's Dorothy at the Shepherd trial. This might be my favorite photograph of Dorothy. Look at that. Dorothy right in the middle. All the, col all the columnists, all the newspaper people, all circulated around her. You can almost see the respect there for her. Dorothy had, was a woman of integrity. She went after the facts. She didn't have a conclusion and then fit, fit, uh, fit the facts to that. She came up with the facts and then had a conclusion, unlike what we see today. How many people from around the world, Iceland, Australia, a soldier in Iraq, other people have emailed me since the books have been published and said, I wish we had a reporter like Dorothy Kilgallen today. God willing, I wish we did too. So she covered that trial, and if you don't remember, Dr. Sam Shepard was supposed to have killed his wife. There was a one-armed man, remember? What movie did it become? The Fugitive, of course. Now, when JFK died, she became obsessed with that case. Now, why, would that, why did that happen? Well, first of all, she was a very good friend of JFK's. He had been to her home and played charades. She saw him at the Stork Club when he was a senator. They became very good friends, and she just weeped when he was killed. But the real topper was this. This is Dorothy's youngest son, Kerry. And you can imagine how a mother would feel when the President of the United States permits you to come to the White House, and while you're there, Pierre Salinger sets up a meeting between the President of the United States and little Kerry. And he makes a fuss over Kerry. He tells him, look, uh, Kerry says, I brought letters from my third grade class, and JFK makes a fuss over those. It gives him a PT-109 pin, just makes a real fuss over him. 
And so when, when uh, uh, Dorothy tried to describe what had happened when JFK was dead, this is what she wrote. The picture that stays in my mind is one of this tall young man bending over a small boy, carefully scrutinizing envelopes until he came to the name Kerry, grade 3B. This is the man who was assassinated in Dallas. You see, her interest in the JFK assassination wasn't business, it was personal. She was, a, uh, she was just an absolute bulldog when it came to cases, searching for the truth, always looking for the truth. That's who Dorothy was. So I began looking into her investigation of the JFK assassination. And what did I find? Yeah, she spent 18 months. And here's why, and I'm going to talk about a few books later in not a very nice way. Here's why she's the most credible reporter to have ever investigated that JFK assassination. She's unlike all of these fancy authors or self-styled experts or whatever. You know why? Because she was there in the front row at the Jack Ruby trial. She listened to the witnesses. She watched them, all right? Firsthand, eyewitness. I'm very proud of the fact that my books don't speculate. I find primary sources, not what somebody said to somebody who really witnessed what happened. So the first one that I found, in fact, I didn't have this in Reporter too much, and then I found it, fortunately, for Denial of Justice. This is the column called Ruby, Stars at Last. And right away here, I hope you'll be as impressed with her writing as I am. She was describing seeing him. The hustler in the black suit and the very white shirt, neat and nervous, is the star of the show at last. Ruby stars at last. If he died tomorrow, and he won't, he would die happy in the knowledge that he had made the big time. Yet little more than a half hour later, the defendant bounced back quietly into the courtroom lightly, like a dancer under clumsy guard. Well, you feel like you're right there, don't you? That you can see him. I was standing by the bar railing as he turned to take his seat and he broke into a quick smile, gave me a friendly bird-like nod and said hello, brightly. Then everything quieted down as Judge Joe B. Brown returned to the bench. Jack Ruby became just a head in the crowd, up front, a bald head shadowed by a few pen strokes of black hair. Jack Ruby described by Dorothy Kilgallen, who was just a few feet away from him during that trial. So what did Dorothy do? Well, she started looking into the facts. And I will tell you right now, she was not interested in Lee Harvey Oswald. He's a dead end. He's been a dead end for 50 some years. And yet there are those people who will continue to perpetuate this ludicrous Oswald alone theory. Well, Dorothy didn't buy it. She looked at the one person that she could investigate and where she would find the truth and who was that it was Jack Ruby first thing she did was ingratiate herself with Melvin Belli Joe Tonahill and the defense team she had dinner with Belli and and Tonahill and you're gonna see uh, proof of the fact that she did as much as she could to learn everything from them so then Dorothy began to do what she needed to do six days Seven days, I'm sorry, after JFK was killed, she wrote the first of scathing columns that would end up causing her death in 1965. All the enemies looked at these columns. Dorothy Kilgallen wasn't going for this Oswald alone theory stuff. She was doing her own investigation. And what's the name of her first column? The Oswald file must not close. President Lyndon Johnson has been elevated so swiftly to his high post that in one sense he has been snatched up into an ivory tower. He is no longer in a position to hear the voice of ordinary people like me talking care candidly. And if he could walk invisible along the streets of the nation and listen to ordinary people talking, he would soon realize he must be sure that the mystery of Lee Harvey Oswald is solved and laid before the nation down to the smallest shred of evidence. Is, if Oswald is President Kennedy's lone assassin, he is the most important prisoner this country has had in 100 years, and no blithe announcement in Dallas is going to satisfy the American public that the case is closed. And then listen to this. The case is closed, well, it, is it? Well, I'd like to know, in a big, smart town like Dallas, 
A man like Jack Ruby, the owner of a striptease honky-tonk, can stroll in and out of police headquarters as if it was a health club at a time when a small army of law enforcers is keeping a tight security card, uh, guard on Oswald. Security. What a word for it. Dorothy on the job, going against the grain, driving the, one, the wrong way on a one-way street, because everybody is doing what? Here's J. Edgar Hoover shouting, Oswald, 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 Oswald alone to the world. And everybody bought it, brainwashed everybody, and they missed the truth. Dorothy didn't. She didn't buy it. Another column, DA to link Ruby to Oswald. Right away, she knew that Ruby was the key. Ruby shot Oswald. We got to look at Ruby. And she talked about that in here. Mark Lane called her the only serious, investi uh, only serious journal investigating the JFK assassination. Enemy circling, watching what she's writing. Now we have this information. We have, of course, Ruby shooting Oswald. What did she do when that had happened? Dorothy Kilgallen arrived in court yesterday and stopped the show. Joe B. Brown, one of her fans, gallantly granted an interview in his chambers. Belle Eye of San Francisco and Joe Tonahill took her to lunch at a nearby seafood house named Vincent's, whose oysters Belle Eye declared are the best this side of Fisherman's Wharf. What did Dorothy write in that column, in the next column? I don't see why Dallas should feel guilty for what one man or even three or five in a conspiracy had done. She was already looking in to the fact that one man didn't do this. And she knew also, she wrote a column, and this is something, something that a lot of people have missed. Years later, Jess Curry wrote a little autobiographical magazine. Well, she interviewed Jess, uh, Jesse Curry. And in here, you know what it says? Guess where he sent the officers first when JFK was killed? Not to the book depository, not to the grassy knoll, but where? The overpass. He sent them there. It's in here. It's in his words. Dorothy wrote a column about that. J. Edgar Hoover then, and I have the uh, FBI file. He had the column. He was watching what she was doing, and you see written on it in his handwriting, wrong in capital letters, wrong, wrong, wrong. He knew what was Dorothy was doing, and he was one of the first enemies that she really had. All right, now, all these authors, you know, boy, I'm going to talk about their books in a little while, but, you know, they don't even think uh, Dorothy Kilgallen was at the Ruby trial, and they certainly don't think that she interviewed Ruby. Well, first of all, here's a photograph. Who's that? That's Belle Eye and, and Dorothy, isn't it? Pretty good proof that she was at the trial, wouldn't you say? All right, let's look at the next one. Well, in fact, let's look at this video. If there's any proof that you need with regard to Dorothy Kilgallen being at the Ruby trial and being involved heavily in this, watch this. You're asking me prognostically rather than uh, uh, in retrospect. Now, the ones we've had, uh, we decided we didn't want those uh, who saw it. I think they saw some, some You're talking very about uh, important things. Now, prospectively, uh, here in Dallas and away from Dallas, uh, when we are moved, we may have to take some who have seen it uh, on TV, not because they're qualified, but because eventually we want to get to trial. But uh, we're not going to go to trial here unless we're forced to trial with witnesses who, who saw this on TV. How but, long does a person have to live in Dallas County to be a prospective juror? What are the residents for? A year in the, in the state and six months in the county. Is there any chance that you might get a transplant in Chicago or New Yorker or someone from another state? Just had one. Just had one. Was that in the jury up in uh, New York? The one that we, oh. the one we challenged for cause to keep from being disbarred. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there she is. In New York Central for the first time, I guess. Her leopard uh, coat. In an American <laughs> court up in uh, Ohio. She was a sharp dresser, wasn't she? There she is. Okay. Now, you know uh, 400 reporters at that trial. How many of them interviewed Jack Ruby? One. Twice. In the books, I have a photograph of the uh, Ruby trial courtroom. And there's a railing between the spectators, media, and the council tables. 
Right behind there, Jack Ruby was interviewed by Dorothy Kilgallen, twice. And you want some proof for that? Well, I'll give you some proof. Here's Joe Tonahill explaining about the interview that was uh, permitted by Dorothy. He wasn't uttering nonsense uh, because this interview with her was a very significant point in his uh, classless life, you know, and uh, I think he enjoyed it very much and cooperated with her in every way that he could and uh, told her the truth as uh, he understood it. And, and it was just a, uh, a very agreeable uh, conversation between them. And I, I, just, I just can't understand people uh, doubting the uh, sincerity of that interview because it was, to me, I watched them and it was a very sincere discussion going back and forth. That's history, isn't it? That's history. All these videos, there's more than 50 of them, are up on the Dorothy Kilgallen story.org. That's all uh, shown in, in both of the books, where you can go look at those for yourself. What I like to do is present the facts for people and let them make up their own mind. Look at these things. That's history. She was there. And I'll tell you how many authors in a little while say she never even was at the trial or interviewed Ruby. So she wrote a column on it, Nervous Ruby Near Breaking Point. And again, the prose is amazing. Jack Ruby's eyes were as shiny brown and white bright as the glass eyes of a doll. He tried to smile, but his smile was a failure. When we shook hands, his hands trembled in mine ever so slightly, like the heartbeat of a bird. I'm nervous and worried, he told her. I feel I'm on the verge of something I don't understand, the breaking point maybe. When Kilgallen told Ruby, I think you're holding up pretty well, he said, I'm fooling you, Dorothy. I'm really scared. She wrote, I went out of the almost empty lunchroom corridor wondering what I really believed about this man. Now you're probably wondering, uh, yeah, what did Ruby tell her? I wish I could tell you. Because when Dorothy Kilgallen died, her files, her documents, everything disappeared. They've never been found. I think I know where they are and I'm gonna keep after it. I'm gonna find that file if it's the last thing I do. But we don't know what he told her. The only thing we do know is shortly thereafter, she didn't go to Washington, D.C. to look into the government or anything. She didn't stay in Dallas looking into LBJ. She didn't go to Cuba looking at the, Ru the Cubans or, or Russia. Where'd she go? She went to New Orleans. She went to New Orleans because Carlos Marcello, one of the most dangerous mafioso in the, in the country, the one with the greatest motive to have killed Jack Kennedy so Bobby Kennedy was powerless, which is exactly what happened, that's where he was, and you'll hear about that a little bit later. Okay, so then what did Dorothy do? You know about the, uh, when the Pentagon Papers were released or the, the Nixon uh, videotapes or anything? Well, Dorothy had a hand in what, uh, some sort of, same sort of thing. She exposed Jack Ruby's testimony before the Warren Commission before it was supposed to be released. Now that's a big deal, if you can imagine. On the front pages of the paper, Outcry over Ruby Leak brings a federal probe. Dorothy had integrity, and that integrity uh, connected with people trusting her with information nobody else got. I don't know if we've got anybody like that today. We don't have a Walter Cronkite or anybody else like that today in news that I know of, or somebody like Dorothy. They all trusted her with material. They knew she'd keep her mouth shut, and in this situation, she did because J. Edgar Hoover was absolutely furious when this obviously appeared in the newspapers before it was supposed to be released. He quickly dispatched these agents. And I, I like to give you this visual. I kind of look at it like these two great, they probably weren't, but great big beefy FBI agents go over to Dorothy's, uh, you know, million dollar townhouse, and here's little short Dorothy, and they sit her on one of her expensive couches and they grill her for hours. Where'd you get this material? Where'd you get this material? I love to think about that image. Well, they weren't successful because I was fortunate to find in the National Archives a memo from Hoover to the Warren Commission describing for the council there the fact that they had tried to get the sources. And what he had to say was, uh, 
Dorothy refused to reveal the source, said it was a responsible person who had a legal right to the transcript. She was the only person who knew the identity of the source. And if you want one comment for her that describes the integrity of this woman, it is this one, that she was the only person who knew the identity of the source and she would die rather than reveal his identity. Imagine that J. Edgar Hoover's a little upset with that. Of course he was. The enemies are circling. Okay, now we get one more uh, uh, column here. Maybe you didn't know. From what I have read, I would be inclined that the FBI might be more profitably employed in probing the facts of the case than rather than how I got them, which seems as a waste of time to me. At any rate, the whole thing smells a bit fishy. It's a mite too simple that a chap kills the President of the United States, escapes from that bother, kills a policeman, eventually is apprehended in a movie theater under circumstances that defy every law of police procedure, and subsequently is murdered under extraordinary circumstances. She didn't buy all that. She didn't buy that Oswald alone stuff. She didn't buy what everybody was saying, her to, uh, saying happened at that time. And then, of course, with regard to the Warren Commission, I'll talk about it in a minute, the Warren Commission report, she summed it up in one, one word, laughable. That's what she thought of it, and she was right. So on, her state, on Ruby's state of mind, she, uh, she talked about you know, what he had, what he had uh, gone through, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So with all this research in mind, I went ahead and tried to see if I could find some eyewitnesses, some primary sources who knew Dorothy. And I was very fortunate to find the fact that videotaped interviews with four people had been possible. You already saw one of them, that was Joe Tonahill. Her two hairdressers, her best friends, Mark Sinclair and Charles Simpson, and a woman who was the last, on the last What's My Line show with Dorothy. And with these video in, videos in mind, then we can kind of get an idea of what Dorothy was going through. You almost can hear the drum beat of the fact that all these enemies are circling. Marcello, she, uh, he's gone to, she's gone to New Orleans to look for him, uh, look at what he's doing. You've got Hoover, you've got other people who are looking at what's going on. And obviously, as I say, she's going against the grain. Well, let's see if we can figure out exactly what was going on in her mind. Going on in her mind. So let's start with Mark Sinclair. He was a very, very close friend of hers, her hairdresser. She trusted him with everything. And this is what he had to say about her talking about, you know, they all knew that she was investigating the JFK assassination. All right, he actually went to New Orleans with her, by the way, and while they were there, and she was putting together what she believed would work. By the way, she was working on a book for Random House that she was going to publish at the end of 1965, just after, I mean, a few months after she actually died in, in November. And um, in that, she was going to put all of her facts, conclusions, evidence, and everything in there. And Sinclair went with her to New Orleans to tie things up, and she immediately sent him right back to New York and said, don't ever tell anybody you were here. Go back there now, and don't ask me any questions. Then he also then talks about uh, here uh, what, she, what she said about what she was doing, her investigation. She wouldn't stop on it. Pre-war and exclusive, yeah. So she had it all. And she told me all about this. And she told Donnell was there too, so I mean, he knew. We knew what she was doing. At this time, did She you said that this would be the case of a lifetime, uh, a story of a lifetime, that she would prove that the president was assassinated. Who assassinated the president? Case of a lifetime to prove who killed the president. How about uh, Dorothy's state of mind with regard to this? I mean, she wasn't a dummy. She had to know that the enemies were circling, all right? She was a smart woman. Let's hear what Mark says about that. Around this time, you used to get her ready for her What's My Line show, and you mm -hmm. would sometimes play the game of What's My Line. Yeah, I played it all the time, yes. Where you would pretend to be a contestant, mm -hmm. like you made. We would play the game. Donnell was there, and we would play the game around her. While you were playing the game once, 
Um, did she ever say something out of the blue about threats in her life? Yes. She told me that this is a couple of weeks before she died, or maybe three or four weeks before she died. I'm not sure of the time anymore. But she told me she was going to get a gun because uh, her life was being threatened. And she was scared for her life and for her family. Going to get a gun. Scared for her life. Scared for her family. Gives you a chill almost. She told other people, um, Yes, uh, I'm going to break the real story and have the biggest sco scoop of the century. And one of Dorothy's problems with this, and one of the things that led to her day death, was that she was a blabbermouth. She told everybody what she was doing. She made comments like that in public. And again, these enemies are out there. Hoover, who wants to just bundle up the thing and, and have it go away. Marcello, other people who you know, could, have, uh, could have been exposed in her book for Random House. So let's also get then uh, the opinion of another hairdresser, and that's Charles Simpson. Let's see what he has to say about Dorothy's uh, last days. This is Charles Simpson. Did you have the feeling that she was investigating the, the murder case of uh, Jack Ruby killing Oswald and Oswald killing Kennedy? Was she digging into that? She never um, quit. She never quit. She dug up something. She dug up something about the assassination of President Kennedy that somebody didn't want her to know because she even told us of her own volition. She said, I used to share things with you guys, and she said, but after I have found out now what I know, she said, if the wrong people knew, what I know, it would cost me my life. And she Hope you can all hear that. If the wrong people later. knew what I know, it could cost me my life. And then Charles Simpson about the uh, Warren Commission and what she was doing. She had a copy of the Warren Commission testimony mm -hmm. sometime she, before. She the printed it on. She printed on the front page of the Journal American before the president received it. And therein lies the tale. From then on, we were stalked. Who's we? Mark, myself, our phones were tapped. They were trying to find out where she got her information from, that she could get this information uh, before the president got it. He was then President Johnson. Now, you know it's easy to talk about this now because it's so many years later, but try to put yourself in that situation that Dorothy was in, all right? It's, to, it's like today when somebody knows something that nobody else knows and they realize if they expose it, they're going to be subject to, you know, who knows uh, what can happen. But Dorothy knew that she knew too much. She was the reporter who knew too much. And so she's scared. People have asked me, you know, did, why didn't she take measures? Uh, yeah, she bought a gun and all that. Well, she thought she was invincible. She was the biggest star of the time on Broadway and across the country. The most powerful female voice in America. She didn't think anybody could touch her. So what, she, what was she doing at that particular time? Because there's only three ways that Dorothy could have died. She could have committed suicide, accidental death, or what? Murder. Well, Dorothy was Catholic to begin with, so suicide's a question mark. Plus, she was on top of the world. She was planning a trip to London. She was working on the tell-all uh, book for Random House. She had a movie deal for the book. She had a lunch planned for the mo uh, Monday after she died. Uh, all of those things were happening, and Mark Sinclair, if you saw a video, said she was just sparkling on the night she went to What's My Line. Uh, he helped her put on uh, a special dress. He put some flowers in her hair. All of that kind of thing. And then if you watch the last What's My Line show, and I'm pleased that an awful lot of young people have, have been inspired by Dorothy and they watch her now on What's My Line. If you get a chance, go in there and take a look at some of those What's My Line show. The best one, probably the funniest, is one with Groucho Marx that you would enjoy. But watch her last show. Now remember, the medical examiner says what? She died of barbiturate and alcohol, right? So, I mean, what happened that evening? Uh, was she groggy on what's my line? Did she show signs of some drug problem or something like that? 
uh, Joe Tonahill in an interview says he was, had lunch with her in New York about a month, I think, before she died. Her mind was sharp. She was just in great spirits and all this kind of thing, okay? Well, on that last show, you're going to see, once again, Dorothy guesses occupations like none of the others could. And one of them was with Catherine Stone that we'll mention in just a minute, but you can see that. So what does Dorothy do? She is on What's My Line. She leaves there and goes to a bar in New York called P.J. Clark's. Maybe you've been there. I've been there. I've sat right next to where Dorothy sat on November 7th, uh, 1965, right there. She had fun, and then she met a mystery man. Dorothy Kilgallen, in my books, I, uh, it's warts and all. Okay, Dorothy had a side to her that many people would probably have problems with. Her husband, Richard, was a Broadway producer when she met him. He fell on hard times. His creative abilities went nowhere. He ended up being an alcoholic. He ended up wandering around with other women, and Dorothy finally was lonely, and she ended up going out with a singer that many of you may remember named Johnny Ray, the little white cloud that cried. Remember that song? He was a known homosexual. Well, he wasn't a homosexual. He was obviously a heterosexual because they had a torrid love affair to the extent that I will tell you right now that Dorothy's son, Carrie, and this was something I had to really consider whether to put in the books, is not Richard's son. It is Johnny, he is Johnny Ray's son. And I've been able to show that and prove it because if you look at pictures of young Carrie, the one she took to the White House, I saw one on the cover of Good Housekeeping back then, or on, on an article in Good Housekeeping, he has golden hair. Richard had dark hair. Johnny Ray had golden hair. So she had an illegitimate son, Carrie. Well, Richard found out about that. He threatened to kill Johnny Ray if they kept up a relationship. So there's obviously motive for Richard to have been involved in Dorothy's death. And he's one of the main suspects. Both books are true crime murder mysteries. I set up the facts for you. I give you all the suspects, you know, and you can make up your own mind. One of them's Frank Sinatra, I might add. She and Frank Sinatra hated each other. She wrote a scathing column about him, his bimbo girlfriends, his affection for the mafia, all of that. So he struck back, and he called her the chinless wonder. If you remember when Dorothy was on What's My Line, there may have been a little absence of her skin. She was not a beautiful woman but she was an attractive, sparkling type of a woman with her, with her personality and all that. At one point in Las Vegas in his act, he held up a key and said that was her figure. He said, if you run into Dorothy Kilgallen, do it with a car. I mean, they did not like each other at all. So I put Frank Sinatra in the book as a suspect. You can make up your own mind as to what may have happened there. She also had an affair with a guy named Ron Pataki. Now, before we get into him, let me tell you what I was able to do. There had never been an autopsy report published about Dorothy's death. Well, I couldn't find one either, and the New York Medical Examiner's, examiner's Office wouldn't give me one, because what? I'm not a member of the family. Well, my wife, who's head of cataloging at the Santa Clara University Library, has a friend, both of us do, at the Library of Congress. We got in touch with her because I just had this feeling that maybe that autopsy could be at the National Archives. And that's where we found it. And so I published it in The Reporter Who Knew Too Much. And as I say, uh, said before, I'm not the greatest researcher who ever lived. Autopsy report, can we put that up? Uh, I'm not the greatest uh, you know, investigative reporter that ever lived. But I looked at this. And remember, what's the, uh, what's the uh, determination? She died of a barbiturate and alcohol. Well, barbiturate was supposed to be second all, which is sleeping pills, right? I read down through here, I found Tulanol in there. Tulanol is a step up in terms of uh, medication to help you sleep. So she had two barbiturates in her stomach. And I'm trying to figure out whether it's accidental death or murder, whatever it is, all right? So now we got two barbiturates in her stomach. And then I was able to find a witness on the East Coast whose father was with the medical examiner's office who said that three years after Dorothy died, a toxicologist there had kept some of her bodily fluids, hoping the technology would help them 
uh, analyzed those uh, specimens, and they found secanol, tulanol, and phenobarbital, three barbiturates in her stomach. They also found a glass that had residue of phenobarbital on it, which meant that it looked like Dorothy drank vodkas and tonics, and it looked like that they had poured, whoever decided to do away with Dorothy, those, the, that powder into that particular drink. So that's what I was able to determine about that, and then I tried to hook it up with, all right, how could she have been poisoned? And that led me, uh, let's see, yeah, that led me uh, to this particular guy, Ron Pataki. Uh, we'll show a picture of him in a minute, but Ron Pataki, if I don't have it up there now, we'll show it in a minute. Ron Pataki was a journalist in the Midwest much younger than Dorothy, 22 years younger, and he kind of latched onto her right as she was investigating the JFK assassination, perhaps by accident, perhaps by not. They had a torrid love affair, according to her. He said they didn't, but I pretty much proved that that, happened, that that had happened. So on the night before she died, she went to P.J. Clark's, and then she went to the Regency Hotel, and that's where Catherine Stone, uh, a witness who was on the last What's My Line program, Dorothy guessed her uh, occupation as uh, selling dynamite, saw Dorothy with a mystery man at the Regency Hotel bar. Now Pataki, uh, Dorothy shared her JFK assassination uh, investigation evidence with him. And we believe that she thought, and we've found that through Mark Sinclair, that he thought she was leaking her information to the wrong people. And they had a showdown that night at the Regency Hotel bar. We believe that, and I'll, I'll give you some more information about Pataki in a minute that really shows exactly what happened. We believe that he either uh, poisoned her with barbiturates put into her vodka and ton tonic drink at the bar or accompanied her home and did it there. Again, the facts are presented for you and you can make up your own mind. But please put up the poem, one of the poems that he's written. I interviewed Ron Pataki three or four times I told him I felt like he was the main suspect in her death. Uh, he made all kinds of, uh, you know, defenses against all of that happening, but I proved that, uh, you know, there was motive on his part because she was going to expose him as leaking her JFK assassination information. And there were other motives as well. So I was able to find on Ron's website this poem. Although he wrote two poems, one of them was, the first one that I found was, Never trust a stiff at a typewriter. There's a way to quench a gossip's stench that never fails. One cannot write if zippered tight. Somebody who's dead can tell no tales. Who does that sound like? He said it was just a humorous poem. If that one's not bad enough, try this one. Vodka roulette seen as relief possibility. While I'm spilling my guts, she's driving me nuts, please fetch us two drinks on the run. Just skip all the, skip all the noise and make one of them poison and don't even tell me which one. You know, one of the things that you worry about as a criminal defense lawyer is if your client provides facts that only the killer could know, all right? Those are facts only the killer could know. He didn't know anything about how, there wasn't anything publicized about how Dorothy could, had died. Proof positive that obviously he was involved some way in her death. Ron Pataki. All right, so then I'd written The Reporter Who Knew Too Much and I could have quit right there, but I decided to write a second book because of three or four reasons. So, reporter who knew too much, followed by denial of justice. And one of the things that happened as I was writing this, I always felt like kind of Dorothy was guiding me. And I'll tell you this, and you may think I'm crazy, I kind of think she chose me to write her story. I'm not sure why. If she did, I'm very honored that she did. But every once in a while, I'd get this idea or something, and it just felt like she was guiding me along. And this is... Uh, I was able to, uh, through I felt some guidance from Dorothy, find the daughter of Dorothy's butler, James Clement. That's who this man is. And my wife and I went to New York City and we were able to interview Barbara de Jordan, or Brenda de Jordan, the daughter, and boy, it, it just opened the floodgates. She could tell us about the parties at Dorothy's, 
uh, you know, at, at the townhouse and Sammy Davis Jr. and Jane Mansfield being there and Jane Mansfield taking off her clothes and her father having to help her put them back on. I mean, there's just some great stories that she could tell us. She could tell us about how her, her uh, father took Dorothy's columns to the Journal American, all kinds of things. How uh, the, uh, the, I'm sorry, uh, the butler and, the, and his wife and the two children lived in the townhouse. So Barbara was a firsthand witness to what went on there. How they were permitted to sit at the dinner table with the other Kilgallen children, like part of the family. And then she gave us some really strong news. She said that Jill, Dorothy's daughter, had said to her father, my mother was killed. We have another witness who said that Jill said that as well. That they all knew that Dorothy was working on the JFK assassination, that her father said, be careful, stay away from Jack Ruby. You shouldn't be involved in all that. But of course, she wouldn't listen. So we learned a lot from Barbara to Jordan, as well as, you heard me say, that FBI agents swarmed Dorothy's townhouse the morning that she died and took all of her documents. That's from Barbara to Jordan, and she knows that happened. In the new book, people ask me all the time, were the deaths of Marilyn Monroe and Dorothy Kilgallen related? Well, as you may know, the circumstances uh, with, with Kilgallen uh, dying, in fact, we should go back, if we may, to when Mark Sinclair found Dorothy Kilgallen's body. If you'll bear with us just a minute, I need to be able to show you that video. If we could do that, uh, I'd appreciate it. In the meantime, I'll talk about, uh, yeah, if you would, Mark Sinclair 3. I'm, I'm sorry. Mark Sinclair is the one who found Dorothy Kilgallen's body. These are the, uh, the, the sad, uh, this is the sad uh, chronicle of that. Did she tell you what her plans for, were for later that night? after what's my mind she was going home afterwards was but she, obviously she didn't because she went to the regency do you suspect that she got a phone call after you left after i left i think she got a phone call from somebody and she agreed to meet whoever it was at the regency that's what that's my belief because she wasn't going to clark's she had asked me if i wanted to meet her because she did not have anybody she was going to meet with and she was not dressing for a date date. Well, she did end up going to Clark's briefly with Bob Bob. Well, maybe, but them. not long. But she, she, would have, she might have done that and then gone home, but there wouldn't have been an evening like she had. Why didn't you accept her offer to go with her somewhere? I was tired myself. We, she, she had done something every day that week, and she had more appointments for me the following week. And I didn't want to see anymore. I wanted to go home. Did she tell you that she had a meeting at her son's school? The next yes, on, um, that, that was sa Sunday. I did her hair before the show, and uh, she told me to um, come the next morning before 9. I arrived at the house at 9, used my key. I think it was about 8.30, 8.45. Used my key, let myself in, went upstairs, and Dorothy was dead in her bedroom. You went to the third floor bedroom that she, she did not sleep in that room. She did not sleep in that room. And when I entered, uh, Dorothy was, she was not in that room, but the air conditioning was on. It was cold out. That's the room. What about that air conditioning vent? Was that? No, that's the dressing room. Oh, no. This that's the heater. Room. That's not an air conditioner. This is the air conditioner. Oh, that's it would, were, it would have been in that position. Right in that same position. And it was blowing out in that room. And I was here. And um, I, the light was on, and she wasn't there. So I turned on my curling irons, and I walked into the bedroom, not thinking that she would be there. And she was sitting up in bed, and I walked over to the bed and touched her, and I knew she was dead right away. And how was the bed made up? The bed was spotless. She was dressed very peculiarly. She was dressed like I've never seen her before. She always dressed in pajamas and old socks and her makeup was off and her hair was off and everything was done. She was completely dressed like she was going out. The hair was in place, the makeup was on, the false eyelashes were on, um, the, the matching peignoir and, and uh, robe, a uh, book laid out on the bed, a drink on the table, the light was on, the air conditioning was on. Though you didn't need an air conditioner, you would have had the heat on. And she was always cold. And why she had the air conditioning on, oh, I don't know. 
Um, possibly someone else had turned it on. Well, maybe to keep the body at a certain temperature, you know. Was the glass on the bedside table within her reach? It was on the right hand side, no, it was way away, way over. And the book, she it was turned upside down, it wasn't in the right position for if you'd been reading, laid it down. And it was laid down so perfectly, you know, like that. And one hand, um, rigor mortis had set in on one hand, the right hand, and it had drawn up the, co the covers a little bit. And there was lipstick on this sh sleeve of the bolero jacket. And um, the light was on, and she was sitting up. It's even better that we brought it up right here because I want to talk about Marilyn's death as well. But you heard him say, eyelashes, makeup, hairpiece on, clothes she never wore to bed, not in the bedroom she ever slept in, book upside down, no reading glasses, no nothing. Does that sound like a staged death scene to you? No investigation. Despite that, they took one look at an empty second all bottle and decided for whatever reason, the ME office at that time was controlled by the mafia, by the way, that's in both books. Close the case up, be done with it. That's what they did, no investigation. So that turns me to Marilyn and Dorothy's death. No investigation of Dorothy's, Marilyn's barely an investigation. I will tell you right now, and one of the things I'm working on if I, if I write a third book is this. The Marilyn Monroe's death was a dress rehearsal for how they killed Dorothy. A lot of similarities there. Drug overdose, found in a bedroom, all these other kind of things. That's something I'm going to investigate as I go along. Okay, here's Pataki, that uh, was Dorothy's boyfriend that I told you about. Uh, one quick thing about him, because I want to move on a bit. Until recently, I couldn't quite figure out how Pataki ended up involved in Dorothy's death, whether he actually gave her the barbiturates or set it up or whatever. And these things happen when you're researching. I found a casino, uh, a casino gambling boss in Las Vegas who told me about uh, the mafia in Vegas and all of that, and then just by chance, while at the end of the interview, asked about Dorothy, he knew who Dorothy was and all of that. And I said, by the way, how about Ron Pataki? He said, well, sure, I know about him. I said, oh, you do? He said, yeah, we knew when Dorothy died that Pataki was around there because, uh, as I understand it, Pataki had gotten himself in some trouble with the wrong people, and those wrong, wrong people were pressurizing him, and then they knew that Dorothy Kilgallen was uh, his girlfriend, basically, at the time, and they made a deal. You tell us what Dorothy's going to put in that book for Random House, and if you do, we'll get you out of that trouble. Well, we think that's what happened right now because what this gentleman said to me gave me a chill when he told me. He said, Pataki told the wrong people, the people in the underworld, whoever they were, Marcello, anybody, whoever that way, the FBI guys, whatever it was, that Dorothy was going to connect, which we believe he, she already had, Marcello, Oswald, Ruby, and that she was going to show how that whole thing was orchestrated with bringing Melvin Belli into to silencing Jack Ruby at trial. And he said to me, when Pataki gave that information out, his, his words, Dorothy was dead. Dorothy was dead. All right, so I decided to see if I couldn't get the New York uh, District Attorney's Office to investigate Dorothy's death, and I got them to. They did a uh, kind of a, uh, told me they were going to do quite a thorough investigation of her death, but they really didn't. And all those details are in the book as far as how far they went and why they didn't go further and all of that. I also tried to do other things at that particular point to see if I could get, uh, find that file of Dorothy's uh, by looking into the FBI files and all of that. But then something happened that really made a lot of difference. And I want to be able to recognize somebody in the audience because that particular person, in my opinion, is a hero. I don't exactly remember when it was, but I got a telephone call from a man named Greg Mullinex, who was a lawyer in Fresno, California. He said he bought the reporter who knew too much or audio tape of it uh, in the afternoon and read it by the time he went to bed and he had a gift for me. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, I have a copy of the Jack Ruby trial transcripts. 
That's Greg right there. He deserves a hand. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I miss them. All of these authors of these books that I'm going to talk about in a minute, they missed them. I think we all felt like that, you know, Oswald or uh, Hoover had brainwashed us all, that the Ruby trial transcripts were probably about what? The insanity defense and all of that. And so nobody took, a, took time to even look at them at all. Well, Greg was nice enough to trust me with them. 2,000 pages. There I am with those. This stack took me two weeks to go through them. Two weeks. We would not have the Jack Ruby trial transcripts if Greg had not brought them along, and I'm so appreciative of him trusting me with them. So what did I do? I went through there, and I will hope I'll, uh, you will be as shocked as I was. Here's the cover page. You can take a look at it. I embedded the Ruby trial transcript excerpts in denial of justice so you can read them. I didn't want anybody saying that I made up this stuff or whatever. So four things stuck out at me right away. Now remember, this is the foundation that we should have had for looking at the JFK assassination. This is where you start. Here's, here's the transcripts right here. This is the Bible, the Bible for the JFK assassination. Sworn testimony by witnesses who have no reason to lie, who were there, who saw everything. This is, this is the truth. And yet, those people who knew about it, and I'll give you an example a little bit later, or those people who didn't know about it, we should have found it somewhere or another long before Greg did, but we didn't. And so we miss things. And when I went through there, I couldn't believe it. I, I was just shocked. I'm sure my wife will tell you I screamed a couple times. First of all, Jack Ruby, according to two witnesses, Don Campbell and John Newman at the Dallas Morning News, said that Ruby came there shortly before JFK was killed and stayed through when he died at 12, when he was shot at 1230, and along with others, looked out at the window in the Dallas Morning News down the street toward Daly Plaza as the assassination was happening. He was watching the assassination, which means he must have known that it was going to take place. You know, Dorothy Kilgallen heard that testimony. And she always looked at little things. For instance, she never believed uh, Ruby was telling the truth. Do you remember anything about him telling everybody that after the, after the assassination at the Dallas Morning News, he was on a twist board, and he was trying to sell this twist board to the uh, employees there? Well, she didn't buy that. If he was supposedly so upset about JFK's death and everything, he wouldn't do that. Dorothy Kilgallen looked at the little things. But remember, she's sitting in the front row, that front row, listening and watching this testimony, and she hears Campbell and Newman say that Jack Ruby was watching the assassination as it took place. All right? Here's the one that really hit me, though. Jack Ruby, what did he say? Well, I just happened to be by the Dallas Police Department uh, basement, right? I just happened to go down there and they just happened to bring Oswald on and I just happened to shoot him. Well, if you, if you believe that, you know, come on. But people have for years and years and years and years. Ruby trial transcript in the page. The conversation was about this man named uh, Hallmark who owned the parking lot across from Jack Ruby's Carousel Club. On Saturday before Ruby shot Oswald, he came over and asked to use the payphone. Hallmark stands there as he's using the payphone and he listens, and here's what he said. Did Ruby say anything with reference to whether or not, concerning whether or not he would be there or not when Oswald was transferred? Did he say anything on that? He told, every, he told whoever he was talking to that he would be there. He would be there, yes stalking Oswald, no question about it. He would be there. It wasn't happenstance that he ended up there. And then in the Ruby trial transcripts, it talks about Ruby, make, he made like a reporter. He told a witness, he made like a reporter to get into the news conference for Oswald in the police headquarters and then get into the basement. And then he used his friends from the Dallas Police Department to get into the basement as well. I hate, 
hate the word conspiracy. There's no conspiracy in this case. It's a plot to kill the president, and this proves it. It's always been in there, and we all missed it. Greg found these things, and I published them. So I've been looking for information where I could corroborate a little bit of this. The one thing about Ruby and the cops, and today I heard more uh, uh, information about that, uh, I found Ruby, or, uh, Dorothy had written a column, claimed Dallas cops lived it up at Ruby's place, and she does this column. Many New Yorkers who worked in nightclubs operated by Jack Ruby and Dallas say they weren't a bit surprised at the revelation that Ruby and the local police were chummy. So chummy, he was allowed to ha they were allowed to hang around, he was allowed to hang around headquarters when they were questioning Oswald. Uh, Oswald. The performers vividly recall jam sessions at which Dallas Cop joined in the fun, some playing musical instruments, others doing turns as singers and comedian at the Carousel Club. They also report that the town's police made Ruby's place their late, late hangout enjoying parties with the strippers and their men friends after the official closing time. Dorothy found that. That's what she did. She found those facts. Watched the assassination, would be there when Oswald was going to be transferred, made like a reporter. If you, if you hear about Ruby at the press conference, he's holding a notebook and a pencil. He didn't just happen to get down there. He was part of the plan, part of the plan. Oswald was captured. Oswald's a loose end. You get rid of Oswald by Ruby, and then you shut up Ruby with Melvin Belli. That's what Ruby found, or Dorothy found out. Now, I have some disturbing news for you, some news that is disturbing to me, and I hope it will be to you. I hope you'll all agree this is primary source information. Dorothy Kilgallen's columns, and now we have the Jack Ruby trial transcripts. That's important material. I hope you'll agree. I assume you'll agree also that this kind of material should be, must be, a part of the sixth floor museum at Daly Plaza. That's where it should be, right? As part of the story, as the other side of the story, Oswald alone, all this. So people, teachers, children, researchers can go into the JFK Museum at Daly Plaza and look at all this material, perhaps that hard copy of the Ruby trial transcripts and all of that, and then make up their own mind about what happened. Wouldn't you agree that makes sense? None of it's there. I happen to be there myself today. It's not there. Why isn't it there? I had a personal experience with the museum this summer. I offered to give them more than 100 uh, documents, videotapes, books, everything about Dorothy Kilgallen, as well as a hard copy of the Jack Ruby trial transcripts. And this was a roller coaster ride until I realized what was going on. I don't know how many of you have been to the museum, but if you go there, I think you'll get the same feeling that most people do, that it's completely, almost completely focused on Oswald alone. I saw that today. All the exhibits about him, all of this kind of thing. There's only two, and I wrote down the, the two quotes about Ruby that I'll tell you about. Otherwise, it's all Oswald alone stuff. It's all Warren Commission stuff. Yeah, they put up some conspiracy theories, but they're so absurd that they make no sense whatsoever. Remember the name of the museum, Sixth Floor Museum at Daly Plaza. It points you directly at Oswald. So I was going to give them all this material from Dorothy. Remember, that's adverse, isn't it, to the Oswald alone theory. The Ruby trial transcripts that are adverse to the, to the uh, Oswald alone theory. First, they love the idea. Then they said the documents weren't originals, so they wouldn't take them. So I wrote a long email and said, you're not going to get originals of these things. They're authentic and they're accurate, and that's what you say you're after on your website. So they came back and said, okay, yeah, I guess that's all right, uh, and everything. In the meantime, I had sent them that material so they could look at it and make sure that they understood how important it was. So then they came back to me, and they said, look, uh, we're going to send you an agreement. So this is the agreement they sent me. Well, I'm just going to summarize it. It's an impossible agreement. No person like me could ever sign it. And this is the first indication, really, that I got that they didn't want this, maybe the second. I had, they demanded that I give them all the copyrights to my books, all the copyrights to books that I hadn't even written about Kilgallen. 
they had the opportunity to reproduce the books, make derivative works, distribute the books by sale or other means, perform the work publicly, display the work publicly, and use sound recordings of the digital audio transmission. They also could give me no guarantee that they would exhibit my material, that they would keep it, they could destroy it if they wanted to. That was the agreement that they sent me, signed by their CEO and by Stephen Fagan, the curator, and Lindsay Richardson, the assistant or whatever curator. Why would you send somebody who's giving you something for nothing, important historical documents about the JFK assassination, why would you send them an impossible agreement? Well, I jumped out of my shoes and I got upset and everything else like that and I told them I couldn't possibly do that. And so then, as I'm more suspicious about the fact that they really don't want these things and can I trust them with them, they say they're gonna send me another agreement. A month or so goes by and then they tell me they're going back to their copyright person before they can send it. I'd had enough. I couldn't trust them. These are historical documents. I couldn't trust them. And I was told by several colleagues, Mark, if you give them to them, they'll throw them away. They'll destroy them. I want them to be part of the, of the uh, exhibits and all of that. I also asked them to speak at one of their programs about the Ruby trial transcripts, the most important JFK assassination documents in history. Do you think they let, would let me do that? Absolutely not. Now you're trying to think in your own mind, uh, uh, why, 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 why would they do this? The museum is only alive because of the Oswald alone theory. Everything they have in there, it's, it's, they lose their relevancy. If you were to put in an exhibit the Jack Ruby trial transcripts and even the four excerpts that I told you about, that blunts everything about an Oswald alone theory. If you put Dorothy's research in there and put in her columns or some of the things that I've found through that, it's, it's just gonna blow away those things. That's why they can't take those things. They can't take the donation that I had. For instance, today when I was down there, Greg and his wife were there with my wife and I, and we went around and everything. There was this, there are two comments about Ruby. A Chicago native, uh, known for his temper and erratic behavior, behavior uh, Ruby had childhood ties to organized crime, although mob-related conspiracy um, theories, evidence uh, suggests that he acted alone. His motives uh, remain in doubt. They know that's not a true statement because they know about the Jack Ruby trial transcripts. In fact, Greg at one point they offered to give, him, give them the transcripts. They said they had some, but they weren't in good condition. So he gave them to him, and what did they do? They didn't put them in an exhibit or anything else. They just put them in their files. They knew. They knew about what was in the Ruby trial transcripts, and they weren't about to do anything with it. And then Mr. Fagan, who's now the curator, Assistant Curator Fagan about why, uh, more questions than answers about why Ruby shot Oswald. Very difficult to know because we really don't know what was going through Jack Ruby's mind when he pulled the trigger. Ruby said, it, said he did it because of his love for President Kennedy in part also to spare Mrs. Kennedy from coming back to Dallas to testify at a trial. But then who, those who knew Ruby well he doesn't tell who these people are. His friends and co-workers, they suggest something different. They say that Ruby simply wanted to be a hero and thought he might receive a medal for shooting the assassination of the president. They envisioned him standing at the door of his nightclub, the Carousel Club on Commerce, as the man who shot the man who shot the president. You look at the Jack Ruby trial transcripts. You look at Dorothy Kilgallen's columns. You look at all of that. This is Boulder Dash. And I just wanted to scream today as I watched young children and older children walk into that museum with their instructors and see that junk, one side of the story, and walk out of there some way or another thinking that one person killed the, the President of the United States. To that extent, I finally filed a complaint with the Attorney General of this state, and I said that under the Deceptive Practices Act, if the, look, if the museum wants to include certain things in its collection, it can do that. 
But it can't go out and say, as it does, we are the authority on the assassinations. We have everything you'll want to see. They send out material with advertising saying that, come to us, we want to show you everything, the truth about the assassinations. The truth isn't there. And now we know for sure that they're deceiving because they won't let the trial transcripts see the light of day or Dorothy, Dorothy's research. I'm still waiting to hear from the Attorney General whether they'll look into this or not. And you know, there's repercussions from this. A lot of repercussions. And wh what are they? Well, they are the fact that researchers, children, whoever it may be through the years, haven't known the truth. It's interesting to note that this, these books that have been written about the JFK assassination, okay? JFK and the, and the unspeakable, James Douglas. The Kennedy Half Century, Larry J. Sabato. Moment of Madness by Elmer Gertz, written a long time ago. Even Dallas 1963 that talks about Daily Plaza and other things. The Two Worst Offenders, Case Closed by Gerald Posner. Junk, Reclaiming History, this is the worst one, by Vincent Bugliosi. The Manson Prosecutor, a thousand pages. I knew Vince. When I found out about Dorothy's research and the fact that she'd interviewed Jack Ruby and she was there and she did all this and the columns I sent him, everything, he said, yeah, Mark, I'll include that in the book. You think it's in here? Absolutely not. It's not in any of those books about the trial transcripts or Dorothy Kilgallen's research. And here's the worst one, this damn Warren report. <laughs> Trash. Those books, I, I mean, I can't even believe I'm saying it. They ought to be burned because they continue to perpetuate these untruths. And we can't have that. This is history. People say, well, who gives a damn about Dorothy Kilgallen dying 50 years ago? Well, I do, and you should too. We want to know the truth. She gave up her life for her country trying to find the truth. People have called her a patriot. Two gentlemen go to her grave every week in New York and put flowers there. She is revered by everybody that knows about her. And she can't get a date at the JFK Museum. There are other examples I could give you of the behavior by the museum, but I, I'm going to leave you with this and then we'll get on to Dorothy and summing up some things there. I got this flyer not too long ago, okay? And this is another deceptive practice. If you could show the flyer. This came through email, museum donor uh, email, the sixth floor museum at Daly Plaza. It's giving day on September 19th. And I looked down through here and I wanted to throw up because here's the last sentence. Help us give all North Texas the chance to visit this Dallas historic landmark that changed the world. Arrogance. The landmark didn't change the world. What changed the world? The killing of JFK, the senseless death of President John F. Kennedy. And they send this out to people. Don't they have any shame? And I've let Fagan and everybody at the museum know. I sent them a copy of my letter that I sent to the Attorney General. And what have they done? Boy, they're really scared. I'll tell you, they're scared to death to the effect that, if you'll go on to the museum reaction to the fact that they know the Attorney General is uh, on the job. Now, what could they do? I've offered to meet with them. I've offered to talk to them about the donation again. I've offered to speak at their programs. Somebody speak about the Ruby trial transcripts. I don't give a damn who it is if it's not me. And what do they decide? Next week's the anniversary of the JFK assassination. What are the main two programs they have? The last day of Lee Harvey Oswald, a conversation with Ruth Payne, toward, and the other one, toward a psychological understanding of Lee Oswald. Just crazy. Just crazy stuff. And as I said, the museum damages the history. How many young people have written essays about this for, for, for when they get back to school? How many teachers bringing those kids in today? And, and I just wanted to say, wait a minute, there's more to this, please. Please, there's more to this. So what do we do now? Well, I'm hoping that perhaps with this, uh, this presentation, I can warn people out there. Be very careful. 
taking people to the museum unless they clean up their act or close their doors one way or another, which might be the best thing to do because they're not telling the whole story and people are being duped by it every day and paying their money. You know, I feel like I've tried to have a contribution to history here myself. I've been very fortunate through Greg and through others to find information. I don't know why I got involved in this in the beginning. I, I, I don't. Maybe Dorothy chose me or whatever, but I'm a man of the truth like she was. I've tried to be Dorothy's voice. I've tried to tell people, educate them about what happened here. All right? And I'm going to keep fighting when government agencies and other people and authors and the museum and others try to close her mouth. They did it in 1965, and it's not going to happen again. The real tragedy here is that this woman died at 52 years old. 52 years old, she died. And that her mouth was shut. She couldn't write anymore. She couldn't do anything. She couldn't live a life that we would hope a woman like that could. I want to close by showing you, maybe you'll remember, that at the time there was a famous program or a popular program called Edward R. Murrow Person to Person. And again, I would say to you, go into the Dorothy Kilgallen story.org. You can remember that. You'll see all the videos. You'll see all the photographs of her. You'll see um, uh, her columns. You can read all that yourself and make up your mind. The Ruby Trial transcripts, I posted those on my website, markshawbooks.com. You can go read those. Spread the word. Spread the word to young people especially about this. But here is the woman that they killed. Dorothy, if you had to be confined to one job of the many that you do, which would it be? Well, Ed, I love television. I have so much fun on What's My Line, playing the game, and I love our morning radio program, too. But I think that I would have to settle for my first love and my true love, the newspaper business. It uh, still has me and always will, I think, I hope. Well, uh... God bless you, Dorothy. Thank you very much. Questions, comments, protests, this is a library where you can say what you want. Any questions? Yes, sir. Do you believe that um, Kerry Colmeyer is the son of Johnny Ray? And also, did you ever, um, were you ever able to speak with Kerry Colmeyer? Well, I think the, uh, Mark Sinclair uh, says in a video that Dorothy told him that Kerry was Johnny Ray's son. The photographs of Carrie at a young age show that golden hair. I don't think there's any question about that. People ask me all the time about the three grown children. Well, uh, I could never get them to cooperate too much with what I was doing. They didn't stand up for Dorothy when she died. Uh, recently, I've tried to do a couple things that I thought might help with that. Uh, I actually sent Carrie Calmer a day, b day before, la two days ago, books, my books about Dorothy that the uh, museum didn't want. Uh, Dorothy's books, she wrote a book called Murder One and a book when she uh, traveled around the world in a race. I sent him uh, the uh, Good Housekeeping magazine. I sent him all kinds of things because I thought he ought to have them. And so I did that. People say, why didn't they cooperate? They don't have very good memories of what happened in 1965 and beyond. Dorothy was worried about Carrie because she didn't think Richard would take care of him. Well, she was right. When Dorothy died, Carrie went to live with Jill and then came back to live with Richard and he threw him out of the house. I think it's three or four years later, Richard committed suicide. So they don't have great memories of what happened back then. And recently I had to make a choice to go forward with something I felt could bring the truth to Dorothy. But to do it, I would have had to have probably uh, gotten the children into a court of law. And if I had done that, I thought it would be too embarrassing for them. I thought it would have been especially tough for Carrie. Dorothy just adored Carrie. You read this article, you'll see. And she changed her will so that he would get uh, an additional amount of money in the will. That will was never found, by the way. We think Richard threw it away. So uh, I'm still hopeful at some particular point they might help with an investigation. I don't know if they think their father killed their mother. I think they believe that Ron Pataki obviously was involved in Dorothy's death, 
but they also know about her obsession with the JFK assassination. And you see back then what they all thought. The two interviews you saw with the uh, hairdressers, this is kind of, kind of amazing. Those are in two, uh, 1999 and 2000. They waited that long to say anything about Dorothy's death. They never cooperated with anybody. And you know why? Because they said they're still scared. And I have had people, including Dorothy's second cousins in Arizona, who would only talk to a friend and not talk to me because they were scared. They said, we don't want to lose one more family member. Now, this is 40 or 50 years later, but they're still worried out there because all of them knew that what happened to Dorothy. She was killed, and who was she killed by? The same people who killed JFK, the powerful people, Hoover, Marcello, whoever else it may have been. So I hope that answers your question. I hope that at some particular point, you know, I, I've never heard from them. So I don't know if they're appreciative of what I've done or not. I hope they are because uh, thousands of people around the world have heard about Dorothy and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, she's gotten her reputation back. Yes, sir. Um, you talk about Marcello and he's kind of not very far down the the, the beaten path. Um, I don't know if you know who Jeannie Carmen was. Do you know I do who not. she was? Uh, I do not, I'm afraid not. Okay. Well, Jeannie was one of uh, Marilyn's best friends. All right. And her children published a book posthumously that said that Johnny Rosselli uh -huh. uh, indicated that uh, Marilyn was killed by Marcello's people, mm -hmm. and that it wasn't the first time that he'd done that sort of thing. And no, no, I don't think it, if you don't mind, I don't think it would be uh, the first time. He was a ruthless guy. His, uh, his billion dollar empire in New Orleans stretched to Dallas. In fact, I don't know if any of you, a good friend of mine out here, a, a fraternity brother, Steve Dillon, uh, went ahead and called my attention to an article, no, no, a, a uh, a, um, a story on Channel 5, I believe it was, about Campisi, the Campisi, uh, David Campisi, the restaurants that you have here, and the fact that he has uh, a relationship uh, through, I believe it's his, what, grandfather or something, uh, Joe Campisi. Well, Joe Campisi and Joe Savillo were Carlos Marcello's underlings in Dallas. Joe Campisi actually had dinner, or uh, Jack Ruby actually had dinner, and there's proof of that, at Joe Campisi's restaurant the night before he shot Oswald. And more than that, you know, some of these things it's hard to believe they didn't put together way back then. Guess who the first visitor was to Jack Ruby in jail? It was Joe Campisi. Mafioso, and they didn't link that in at all. They just missed all those things because they, were, they didn't care. They had uh, Oswald, and that's what happened. So that was pretty interesting that way. One more question, and uh -huh. this is about, um, there was a handwritten note on the autopsy report about CO2. What the heck was CO2 doing in her bloodstream? You know, it's interesting. There are people, and I, I want to answer this, uh, people around the world who study the JFK assassination, every aspect of it, every scintilla of material that they can find. I have great respect for them. Uh, I'm not one that can do that. I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about where the bullet was or where the trees were or anything else like that. I'm a Dorothy Kilgallen uh, follower. No, this was in Dorothy's autopsy. Oh, Dorothy's autopsy. Yes. What, you said what was there? CO2. Uh, I don't recall, but I, it may have been in there, but we've never been able to figure that out, obviously, if it was. No. Sorry, excuse me for saying that. But the, the point is that people, I respect anybody point of view. Let me just give a shout out to this library. They permit all kinds of points of view about everything. Tom Keener and Jeff Timms. What if they said to them, what if they tried to put on programs that only favor one side or the other of things? Okay? They don't do that. That's what libraries are all about. That's what we should be about. We should hear all sides of the story and why that damn museum won't do that is a tragedy. Any other questions? I'm cussing too much, aren't that's I? That's okay. Money, money. Six billion, that's a six million dollar operation down there, by the way, in case you don't know. That's what they take in every year. We will cover all questions, but I want to go front to back so I don't have to do a lot of walking. Thank you. Just yes, sir. One, one quick one. 
in your research, have you seen real honest complicity to, from LBJ, Clint Murchison, and that group in all of this with the assassination? Well, if I said I look at motive. If you want to look at motive, you can't farly go any further than LBJ. He probably benef benefited than everybody else. The problem with LBJ, and again, uh, is, is the layers of, you know, he was involved, Murchison, all these other people. Nobody's been able to kind of get through all those layers. That's a problem with Marilyn Monroe's death, too, is you can't get it through all the layers to who it was. Dorothy's is much easier that way. So the answer is no. Uh, but boy, if you look at motive, uh, some people were talking about LBJ, LBJ today and, you know, the fact that obviously he could have been involved there, but I don't think they've ever been able to, uh, you know, connect him as much as you would like to see happen. Questions, comments? Okay. I'm curious if you have any fear for your life bringing this out. Well, uh, that goes with the territory in what I do. You know, I've written books about Mike Tyson's trial that nobody liked. Uh, I've written books about uh, Jonathan Pollard, the spy that nobody liked. Uh, my email's been hacked. My uh, Facebook page has been hacked. I've gotten some nasty emails from people, but I will tell you more than anything, I think I haven't worried about it too much uh, because, again, it goes with the territory, but um, for the most part, it's been overwhelming response from people around the world who have just fallen in love with Dorothy. And I think because that's happened, they really haven't wanted to go after me too much that way. Uh, the criticism that I've gotten, some people weren't happy that I told the story about Carrie being an Ill illegitimate child, but I felt like that was part of the Dorothy story because, she, you know, just one quick, I don't want to keep you too long, but I'll tell you, she got really scared one time before she died. She woke up one morning and the New York newspaper, we couldn't find it and we don't know which one it was, but we knew, do know it happened. There was a picture of K Carrie, and I have a feeling this was a warning to Dorothy. He was walking across, uh, running across Central Park, and the picture was in the New York paper, and it scared her to death because she thought somebody was um, following, Dorothy, or following Carrie. They were after her son. To the extent that, and we confirmed this because in a What's My Line program right after that, it was right near uh, Halloween, uh, they laughed about it on the show because she put Carrie in a limousine to trick or treat. And she was scared to death of, of what happened there. So, you know, you never know what's going to offend people, but if you're, if you're looking for the truth, you know, with this situation, you, you people don't have to do anything about it. But if you want to call the Attorney General's office or you want to send a letter there and say, hey, look into this, you can. I think in this day and age, we, we too often let things go by that bother us, especially when they're about the truth. Uh, you know, we've lost some of that, I think, for some reason. Right yes, sir. Hi, thanks. Uh, very interesting talk. And I remember six, uh, that week in 63 very well. But uh, there's something uh, that, that Jack Ruby supposedly said that uh, I think I got it from there. 30 years ago, there was a JFK assassination center at the West End when it was a popular place to go in Dallas. Well, is that right? Yeah, they, they had a lot of information there, but there was a, there was a comment that Jack Ruby made that, uh, take me to Washington, I'll talk, but if I stay in Dallas, I'm a dead man. I was wondering if you ever heard that. Well, yeah, and I think it was part of that one where he said, uh, you know, I can't ever tell what happened, the truth, and all that kind of thing. Uh, you know, again, remember, uh, you know, I'm not putting down people who, who go for this Oswald thing, but Ruby was the key. He was the key. And Dorothy knew that. And that's why she focused so much on him and, uh, you know, uh, exposed his uh, Warren Commission testimony and interviewed him. And nobody else did that. She, was, she really was felt like that he was the key in everything. So he may have made those statements and everything else like that. But again, you have to remember, nobody was listening. Nobody was listening. Those columns were out there. She wrote eight or ten columns, basically saying the Oswald alone theory is baloney. And Ruby stood up outside there by a railing, if I remember, in a courtroom and said those things. But nobody paid attention. Why? Because Hoover was, was you know, basically just brainwashing everybody. And, and, and uh, you, I'm sure you know why. And, and some people have said to me, well, the, the, the JFK Museum down here is doing this to protect Dallas. Because if there's a plot to kill the president and people in Dallas 
knew about it, they should have stopped it. But if it's a lone nut, you see, then nobody in Dallas could do anything. And that's the same reason that Hoover did what he did, what he said, because he couldn't be held accountable if it's a lone nut. All right? And so I think all of that uh, has to do with the fact that, for whatever reason, nobody was listening way back then. I mean, Joe Campisi was the first visitor. Oh, I'll tell you another one. I don't know if you remember who Candy, uh, Candy Barr was, the stripper, all right? Well, Candy Barr got in trouble uh, for marijuana possession. Do you remember this? All right. Well, when I interviewed Bill Alexander, I didn't realize Bill Alexander prosecuted Candy Barr for that marijuana possession in front of what judge? Joe Brown, the same judge, okay? And who did Candy Barr, who did uh, Jack Ruby call after he, I think after he got arrested or whenever it was, he talked to Candy Barr. I mean, there's, there's a whole part of that that nobody ever even looked into. And who was Candy Barr's fiance at some point? Do anybody have an idea who that might be? Mickey Cohen, Belli's main client. And Belli handled the appeal for Candy Bar. I mean, there's a million ways you can go with some of this, but nobody figured that out. There's not one newspaper story about the fact that Mickey Cohen, Belli's client, one of, the, one of the most dangerous mobsters in the country, that he's connected to Belli. If you had that, then you connect Belli to you know, and Belli statements and everything just didn't happen. Nobody was listening. Yeah, just one other thing. Uh, a friend of mine, there's like 30 years ago, he passed away, but uh, mm -hmm. um, he knew Marina Oswell real well, and it was a passion of his, the whole thing. And he's actually, he was actually quite famous at the time in his own right. He was, the year he passed away, he was on three talk shows. But he, uh, he, you know, he said from Marina Oswell, he maintained that Lee Harvey Oswell um, was, it, it, what, he wasn't the primary guy. I forget exactly how he said it. There's people that know him better than I, but we used to like talking about that. It was, you know, it was not Lee Harvey Oswald. So I there's always a, believe that. Yeah, there's a really good book. Uh, I can't think of the name of it, but it basically, this is an eyewitness who was a uh, kind of a drug runner and uh, other things in New Orleans. And it's his firsthand account of how many times he saw Oswald with Marcello at his office around there and all of that. I think it's pretty, uh, pretty believable in terms of that connection there. But you see, Dorothy didn't go with that. She, she really looked at motive. Joe Kennedy double crosses the mafia. They helped him win Illinois and, and, and West Virginia. They win the election. If we win the election, we'll leave you alone. I have an eyewitness that I found, a very revered newspaperman, who was right there when Joe Kennedy ordered JFK to appoint Bobby Attorney General. What does Bobby do? He goes after those people, especially Marcello, because uh, he hated Marcello and all of that. And what is Marcello, what is Marcello doing as November of 1963 comes around? He is in, 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 in has a trial in, uh, in uh, New Orleans for racketeering. Bobby Kennedy helped orchestrate that, and he's about to be deported. Well, his back's against the wall. He's got to do something. He hates Bobby Kennedy, but he, if he kills Bobby Kennedy, Jack Kennedy will come after him with everything the government has. But you kill Jack Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy is powerless. And I will tell you right now, you can look it up. They never bothered those guys again. Now, I think that makes common sense in terms of what happened here. And then you bring Belli into it and all of that. But there's an awful lot of people who would disagree with me. Yes, sir. Did you come across any evidence that Dorothy started her book? Uh, yes, good, good point. I should have brought that up. Uh, she showed, uh, she was working on it, and she had showed uh, chapters to, uh, I, I don't know if you know, but Bennett Cerf, who was on, you know, with her on What's My Line, he was the publisher, founder of Random House. The night before Dorothy died, at the last show, he showed, she showed him chapters of that book. We don't know what really happened to that, but three years later, the book Murder One, which is a collectible item right now, Murder One was published under Dorothy's name, and it was all about her trials and everything else. And in the, excuse me, in the preface, uh, in the foreword to that book, 
there's material in there that looks like it could have come from a book that she was writing about the assassination. Yeah. Is it possible that she told other people her suspicions or her findings? Well, people have asked me, uh, did she have a copy of her, uh, her file? She should have had. Well, back then you didn't, couldn't go down to Kinko's or whatever, so she couldn't do that. Basically, all you had was a carbon. But she was very closed mouth about it. The only people she talked to about it were the two hairdressers and Ron Pataki. And we believe, anyway, that she didn't really speak to anybody else about it, except to tell them what she was doing. She didn't give them a specific. She just told them they're going to crack the case wide open and all of that, which was obviously an invitation to eliminate her. And then that's what they did. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. I'm not really sure exactly how to put this, but. It won't matter, please. Um, this is kind of whatever. Assuming Oswald was guilty and Ruby were guilty and all that stuff, why? should uh, you know Dorothy be murdered I mean if she if all of the thing if everything were going to exonerate them is that the only reason you know well yeah it's it's almost the same situation you're in with the uh, sixth floor museum you can just about let anything into the to the uh, to the equation you can let Dorothy's uh, material in you can let my material in research whatever it may be all of that can be then considered along with the other evidence that happens, and you can discount that in, all, in everything, right? You can do that. But you can't do it with the Ruby trial transcripts. And that's where Dorothy watched this. Remember, she's in the courtroom. She's listening. Oh, here's another thing. I always wondered, wait a minute, the reason that they uh, uh, found Jack Ruby guilty is because they didn't buy the insanity defense, or uh, because they didn't, you know, the insanity defense, right? Well, they didn't, but they had heard also the evidence of Ruby's actions before he shot Oswald, which were in the Ruby trial transcripts. And so the jurors had to have said to themselves, look, he couldn't have been crazy if he's watching the assassination when it took place, he, if he said he'd be there when it happened, if he snuck into the basement ma making like a reporter. I think we now know why the jury decided what they decided. So you can get around anything. You, people can say I'm crazy or Dorothy is or whatever, but that's sworn testimony, and it's believable. And if you listen, if you if you listen to it, I think you'll feel the same way. So Dorothy had that information. That's what made her lethal. That's, in my opinion, what made her lethal. She was going to publish some of the transcript uh, material that she'd heard, and it would have blasted away. Uh, I like to say in the book that I believe if she had done that. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover would probably have been indicted. Marcella would have been arrested. They would have put all that together and everything, but nobody was listening. Yes, sir. Uh, this is actually all very enlightening. I'm actually just here for extra credit for class, but uh, <laughs> com <laughs> com coming from uh, basically someone who's really not even interested in this entire subject. Um, this is... <laughs> okay, good. And I'm sorry, that sounds very... Oh, no, that's all right. Um, it's actually very enlightening. Um, you've definitely brought light to this whole situation. Like, clearly there's something more going on um, with the whole assassination. Like, there's... Mm -hmm. Like, I truly believe there's no way that it's just Oswald. Mm -hmm. um, but then that only raises more questions for me. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm just curious what your thoughts are as to, um, so since we've kind of more yeah, or less yeah. cracked open that it's not a one man job, um, do you believe that Oswald is in fact the shooter as well? I think he had a part in this. I think he had a part in this, certainly. Remember Jess Curry sent, the, sent the everybody to the overpass. You know, there are all these other things that happened during that, a lot of confusion and all of that kind of thing. Um, I just think it's, it's unfortunate that they just uh, focused in on Oswald, who said he was a patsy, but nobody was listening, um, and then stopped. They just basically stopped. You know, I read something today, oh, I think it was at the museum, as a matter of fact. Uh, it said that, uh, and I, I'm not sure I knew this, or maybe uh, you will, um, the assassination of a president at the time was not a federal crime. It was a local crime. So Jess Curry and his, his, or, you know, his police department should have 
taken over this whole thing. Well, right away, what happened? Hoover marched in, took over, had all the documents sent to Washington, all these other kind. That's unfortunate, because I think, and Jess Curry has said, if he could have had some time with Oswald and his detectives and everything, he probably could have found out what happened here. But uh, with Oswald, uh, those who were involved in his participation, they couldn't let him live. I mean, they couldn't do that. You got loose lips there, and you got to get rid of him, and you got the perfect guy to do it. There's Jack Ruby, a wannabe, um, a big star in the, in the mafia. That's what he wants. And, and, you know, there's lots of reasons why they would have been able to recruit him, but he was the perfect guy to do that. One of the reasons is just common sense, all the friendships with the police. I, I saw today where it said that Jim Lavelle, you know, the um, uh, detective that's holding on to Oswald, in the, in, the, uh, in the audio it says, and Jim, and Jim Ravel says, yeah, I saw Jack Ruby standing there with a uh, pistol in his hand. Well, obviously he knew the, who it was, right? And, then, and yet, if you look at the Warren Commission, what'd they say? Oh, there's no evidence of Jack Ruby having uh, friendships in the Dallas Police Department. Come on. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, you were talking about uh, relationship there with uh, Yes. Uh, uh, now I forgot what I was going to ask. Uh, That's okay. That's what, so what happens when you get older. Think about it a minute. It's all right. It's oh, all right. The uh, instance where Oswald uh, Wagner Carr, the state attorney general of Texas, this is what I was going to mention. Uh, he had actually had jurisdiction over the case because it was a state crime, and his, his uh, state agency was investigating this until it was shut down by LBJ. And in his investigation, and I found this out because when he retired, he was a graduate of Texas Tech, and he donated all his personal property and papers to the Southwestern Collection at Texas Tech University when oh. they're all still there. And uh, I went through now, who, there. Who is this again that did this? Wagner. Wagner Carr. He was the state attorney general of Texas oh, in 1963. Time. And he, his investigation turned up the fact, and this is in his documents that's in, in the collection at Texas Tech, that Oswald was a paid FBI informant. There was, oh. he, went, he was an informant number 179, and he was being paid $200 a month by the federal government. Now, ironically, when Oswald was arrested at the Texas Theater and brought back, the uh, Dallas County Sheriff, when they were going through the contents of his wallet, they found a receipt for a government voucher for $200. Wow. What a coincidence. No, no there's no coincidence in life. That's fascinating, and that should have been followed through some way or another. I, I've never heard that before. I had no idea. Uh, you know, uh, when I said Oswald was a dead end, I shouldn't say that. He's a confused uh, man. You, you can't ever figure anything out there. You can't come up with any conclusions because it's just all over the place, just like something like that. That may be the truth. Who knows? Dorothy didn't want to get involved in that. She saw Ruby as the key, and I do too. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Shaw, uh, let me thank you for coming and also thank Allen Library to put this program together. I'm just, just fascinating and uh, it's an honor to be here and thank you for giving us this opportunity. Well, it's my honor. Uh, I, I uh, appreciate it very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And again, uh, I will say, you know, I wouldn't be here if, uh, if Tom and, and, uh, and Jeff, uh, you know, didn't ask me to come. Uh, and they, they knew what I was going to talk about. They didn't have to. Uh, they would you know, feel like it's going to be controversial or whatever, but that's what this is all about. You want to present all sides of the equation, and I, I really appreciate that. It's a wonderful library. So. Thank you. Uh, this young man is not my student, and, uh, but I, I'm very glad that he's here for extra credit. Yes, uh, good. <laughs> as a statistician and also as a mathematician, I have studied this. Somehow I think my life has been uh, it's a mystery that how I end up with JFK. I, it just uh, amazes me. Coming from 10,000 miles away, oh. and uh, in 78, I was like a nanosecond away from uh, Lee Harvey, Oswald Marina, all of us home. Oh. And then for 12 years, I worked in downtown when I was teaching and passing oh. by JFK. Um, uh, assassination that, I guess, so-called X which I think is morbid to let cars drive by it. But I mean, that's my opinion. Yeah. Uh, and I do agree with you on the sixth floor museum. I never took my students there because I Good know it's you. just 
absurd. It, it, uh, does, it doesn't have to be that way either. It doesn't have to right. be that way. If they'll be flexible about things, and but it's difficult for them to do. How are you going to put the Ruby trial transcripts in there and then keep? You know, they could call it the Sixth Floor Museum in tribute to Lee Harvey Oswald if right. they wanted to. Right. That's up to them. But you can't go out and promote it as the landmark that changed the world, or we're educating people, yes. or we're the place where you should come. That's deception to people who are paying their money. And the problem is, of course, they don't know what they're missing right. because they don't promote any of that. They don't promote anything that's not pro-Oswald alone. So all of those people that went there today, they say they have 400,000 people come through there every year. Yeah. When they come there, uh, oh, they don't know what they're missing. They don't know that the Ruby trial transcripts exist. They don't know that Dorothy Kilgallen's material exists. So they, do, they can only, you know, watch and listen to what is provided for them. I, I, don't, I don't know how the, the, the people at the museum look themselves in the mirror now this way, especially when they know about all this material and won't permit it to be in that museum. Uh, one, yes, one, sorry, one more thing I need to say because uh, this young man here, he needs to understand in 50s and 60s, even up to this point, it's, the Russians do it very well. I think the term, if I translate it correctly, it's called a sparrow. It's named after that bird. Uh, usually they send a young, handsome man or a, uh, or a lady mm -hmm. uh, in order to, I guess, extract information from you. Uh, recently, they just did it in, in Iran as well uh, to, I guess, undermine someone that they think is dangerous. So I think George Patak, it, it doesn't surprise me, or Ron Patak, sorry, it doesn't surprise me that why somebody must have set him up with yeah. Dorothy uh, for that reason, to extract information yeah. in a romantic way. I can uh, also, the Russians are perfect at it, actually. I I mean, they've done you, it before. Yeah, I should also tell you, Ron Patak is still alive. He's 84, lives in Columbus, Ohio. I continue to pile up information about him and what he did, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end up getting him indicted at some particular point because there's no question he had something to do with Dorothy's death. All you have to do is look at those poems for him to have had you know, some part in, in whatever happened. And I'm hoping that if we can get him arrested at some particular point or charged with a crime that he will let us know what happened back then. So we'll By the way, before we – we're going to take three more questions, but uh, – we have on YouTube called Oswald's Last Call. We have two million hits. You'd be one of them. Hello. You uh, mentioned yes, a couple of facts that I find very interesting. One is after the trial, she went directly to New Orleans. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's Whatever. Where, that's what where it, Carlos Marcello is. That's right, exactly. And, uh, you know, Again, I think what the problem we have is I wish, you know, that she had written down and we had what, Oswald, what uh, Ruby told her. We don't have that. But as I said, she didn't go anywhere else except she went to New Orleans, and that was where Marcella was. Mm -hmm. And she had a scary experience. That's why she sent Mark Sinclair, the hairdresser, back to New York and all of that. So uh, we, well, we have to believe leave. that whatever Ruby said sent her there. That's, yeah, that's a very important point that I didn't know about. Mm -hmm. And also, could you elaborate a little bit more? You said there were two witnesses uh, from the transcripts that testified mm -hmm. that they saw Jack Ruby watching the assassination. What, what were the witnesses and what was their background? They were, uh, one, I, I have to go back to my notes, but uh, one of them was, I think, a circulation manager and the other uh, might have been a salesman or whatever, they testify that, now you remember that uh, the time that um, uh, JFK was killed was 1230. Uh, Ruby showed up at 12, I think they say 1240 or 1235, one or the other. And uh, apparently uh, we were trying to figure out how far away the uh, Dallas Morning News building was. And it was quite a, f a number of blocks down from Daly Plaza. But if you were there, you could have seen into Daly Plaza. How clearly, we don't know. But they had a window in the corner. And the one man testifies that Ruby got there, I think, at 12, 25 or 12, 30 or something, and was there uh, until that guy left. And the other guy then testifies that he was there after that, and Ruby was there the entire time. And he was standing 
with everyone looking out at Daly Plaza as the assassination happened. And from that testimony, you get the feeling that they realized that obviously it wasn't by accident or coincidence that he was there for that. You know, he always said he was selling advertising or whatever. They don't mention anything about that. I think they were just uh, of the belief that, uh, you know, why was he there at that particular time? So that's their testimony. And I can give you the, uh, the names I gave them to you before, but I can give them to you, but they're in both of my books. Thank you. I was curious, yes. when you're talking about Bobby Kennedy and J. Edgar Hoover, do you have a theory about Jimmy Hoffa? <laughs> I kidded Greg down here today that Jimmy Hoffa may be buried in his backyard yeah. in Fresno. You know, that's, uh, that's, every time I think of uh, Jimmy Hoffa, if you don't mind my saying something you'll laugh at, I think of Uber. You know why I think of Uber? Because if Jimmy Hoffa would have been alive when anybody started a, uh, a service like Uber, uh, they would have been killed. <laughs> with those uh, union people, they would have never put up with that at all. It would never, Uber would not be there today. Hoff is just a, 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 a mystery. Now, there's some, if you don't mind, there's a, a, another little connection I'll tell you about. Uh, there was a lawyer in Florida named Frank Ragano, and he passed away, but I was able to interview his wife, Nancy. And he represented an interesting triumphant, if that's a word, triumph, whatever. Anyway, uh, Carlos Marcello, Santo Traficante, who is a gangster in Florida, and James Hoffa. And Belli was a very close friend of Ragano's. And after the Ruby trial, uh, Rag Nancy Ragano told me she was with uh, her, uh, her uh, with, with um, Traficante. And, and Belli, and they were around and everything. And one way or another then, uh, Rogano said to Traficante, well, what about Belli and Ruby? And he said, whatever you do, don't ask Belli about Jack Ruby, which meant that somehow or another that was connected in there. And here's Hoffa in that whole ex you know, exercise too. And nobody hated Bobby Kennedy any more than James Hoffa. As you know, he tried to strangle him once in Washington. So that whole connection in with Hoffa, I really looked into that at one particular point in terms of him, his active participation in the JFK assassination, and I really couldn't find a, uh, a connection there. It was much easier doing that with Marcello and Sam Giancana in uh, Chicago. Yes, sir. I had a question regarding about Mark Sinclair, who witnessed or found her body, Dorothy. No police report or personal possessions that were taken away um, being investigated that you're aware of when you talk to Mark? I mean, no. if, uh, he, if he was describing the whole room was kind of odd, yeah. you would think that he would say, hey, I, this, is, this is not, she didn't kill herself, someone murdered her. He left right away. He left right away after he found the body, scared to death. He didn't want anybody to talk to him or anything else, and he didn't talk for 50 years. And I, I will tell you that with, with Mark Sinclair, I hope that you looked at his, you know, now this is information from a long time ago, right? And I did not conduct those interviews, all right? I know the people that did, they're very responsible. But if you, if you watch uh, his, his uh, watch Joe Tonahill, if you watch uh, Charles Sin, uh, uh, Sinclair, Mark Sinclair and Charles Simpson, you, you kind of get a feeling that it looks like they're telling the truth. A couple times words are, they try to put them in their mouths and they won't do it. Um, I think they're, they're very credible in terms of what they said. And they were heartbroken when Dorothy uh, died because she was so close to them and everything. So those are the kind of witnesses that I, I try to find. Uh, yeah, I didn't interview them myself, but I know who did, and, and I think they're very credible. Yes. Hey, Mark, how deep have you looked into the Santo Traficante end of that of that, that because of the connection he had with Marcello. I think that's one of the uh, most fascinating mafioso in history. Uh, a mild-mannered man, uh, Frank Regano represented him, and uh, you know, really, uh, Nancy talked about what kind of person he was. Uh, that uh, he, he was very <laughs> low-level, but he was a uh, you know he had people who could do bad things to others. She talks about on the day that JFK assassination occurred. 
that Traficante, I believe it's Marcello, yeah, Marcello, and she, and she was a very young woman at the time, celebrated the death of JFK at the, I believe it's the International Hotel in Miami, toasting uh, JFK's death. And it really bothered Nancy to the point that she left her relationship uh, with, um, with Regano for a while because it really upset her and gave her the feeling that they obviously had something to do with JFK's death. Well, the reason, the, the reason I'm saying look into Santo Traficante, um, he hated Kennedy and it had to do with the Cuban Missile Crisis. I think that's, I think that's correct, um, and, and the casinos and the whole thing. Yeah. Right, and supposedly he admitted to his lawyer in 1987 before he passed away that they killed the wrong Kennedy. They should have got Bobby, not John. Look into that angle because yeah, that's very, it's, it's very interesting, very, very possible. Again, uh, nobody liked Bobby very well. That's for sure. That's for sure. And who, who killed Bobby? JFK or RFK Jr. now thinks that Sirhan Sirhan did not, that it was the other guy in the room. Uh, who knows? Uh, if I had to guess, I'd tell you that they couldn't let Bobby Kennedy become President of the United States, the same people that killed JFK. They were about to let him become President of the United States. If I had to really investigate that death, and I'm not going to, but if I had to, I'd start with the same people who were involved with killing JFK because they got rid of Bobby, right? So they're powerless and they're not going to go after him anymore. And now Bobby pops up again and he may become president of the United States. You're going to let him do that? Absolutely not. Was there somebody over here? I thought I, thought I saw a hand. That was you. Okay. Yes, sir. Basically, it was just a comment that I never believed the stories as they present them now about uh, Kennedy's death. And there was used to be a, a radio personality that used to say, and now for the other side of the story, or the oh, other yes, side of the right. page. I think that's true, yeah. Well, you just presented the other side of the page for me yeah. to where I can, uh, I can just say to myself, mm -hmm. I knew that wasn't true. It couldn't be. It just never well, made anything, any anything sense. Can, anything can be true, and I don't stand up here saying I'm right. But, uh, you know, I've got to go along with Dorothy, you know. Uh, she, she loved JFK. And it was a senseless death. They, they, they should have never killed JFK. They should have killed Bobby. And JFK then was killed at, a, at an early age, just like Dorothy was. There's two people that should have lived a long time. And unfortunately, um, they both were killed at, er, at early ages. So yeah, there's the other side of the story, but there will be people who will hear what I have to say as they have done. I mean, I, I'm very blessed that with the two presentations I've made on the reporter who knew too much and denial of justice, there's more than 100,000 hits now. And so I feel good that people at least have gotten that side of the story. They may not change their mind or whatever. I will tell you that I, I let, okay, I'll just tell you this. I wasn't going to, but I will tell you this. I let the media in Dallas know about my sending a complaint to the Attorney General, and I asked them to look into it. And that includes a couple reporters with the Dallas Morning News, uh, it includes a man with the, uh, the editor down at the uh, Statesman American in Austin, uh, I, I, with all of them. And I also let a gentleman at, the, not heard, I haven't heard from any of them. And then I let a gentleman named uh, Patrick Williams know at the uh, Dallas Observer. I had a conversation with him the other day where the first thing he said is, I'm not going to do with anything with this because I, uh, I know uh, it, was, it was Oswald alone. And why do I know? Because of a uh, case closed. That's my case. And I said, will you just listen to me for a while? And I gave him pretty much some of the information that you just heard. I felt like I was talking to a doorknob. He did not want to hear any of that, and he wasn't about to look into any of this at all. That's his prerogative. But as I said to him, you know, it's really too bad that you don't want to look into this. It's too bad you're not someone like Dorothy Kilgallen. I don't think he appreciated that comment, but I said it anyway. You know, come on, you're a newspaper person. Follow up on this. See what's going to happen. I want anything to do with it. This is his Bible, not the Ruby trial transcripts, that's for sure. Can I hear? 
Yeah, um, uh -oh. could, <laughs> uh, you've been instrumental in trying to get the DA's office in uh, New York City to reopen the investigation. Yeah. To, can you tell everyone about your efforts in that regard? Complete failure. How's that? Here, here's what happened. Uh, 50 plus year old murder case, right? All right. So the reporter who knew too much came out in uh, 2017 and I wrote a long letter to Cyrus Vance Jr who you may have heard of, gotten some bad publicity with regard to dealing with the uh, leader of our country, uh, DA in New York City. I sent him this long letter and I said, hey, and I sent him the reporter who knew too much. And the agent and other people, my wife even, I think, thought I was crazy. They'll never look into a, a murder a case like this. And lo and behold, the next thing I knew, he told Sue Edelman at the New York Post, yeah, we're going to look into this. And I was as happy as I could be, and they promised a thorough investigation. So for the next few months, they uh, gave me a uh, former homicide detective named Richard Ramos as my point person. I sent him material uh, through the uh, email of uh, witnesses, uh, documents, evidence report, uh, the autopsy. I sent him everything that way, and then we agreed to meet in New York City. I think it was June the 4th of 2018. Uh, at the DA's headquarters downtown. He was so excited. I normally handle embezzlement cases, he said. My dad is so excited, he started watching more What's My Line. Uh, I, I, mean, I mean, this is just something I can't believe I got this case. He was so excited. And by the way, I, I, after looking at your book, I, I wonder if Ron Pataki didn't sell Dorothy's secrets to the wrong people. I walked out of there floating on air. I'm going to get my thorough investigation. So a couple months go by, and they let me know, Ramos does, that they're going to give me an update. I answer the phone, and I'm expecting some good news or an update, and this Eugene Hurley, who was the assistant district attorney assigned to the case, comes on the phone, and I knew right away there was a problem. And he said, Mr. Shaw, uh, I'm sorry we've looked into this. Uh, we can't find any harm that came to Dorothy. I said, well, what about the stage death scene? No, we can't can't find anything there. How about Ron Pataki, all the evidence that I gave you? How about the 22 witnesses I gave you? Uh, and then he finally said, got aggravated, he said, Mr. Shaw, I'm not going to argue with you. Besides, we don't know who did it. <laughs> That's what he said. Wasn't that an omission? <laughs> so I went ahead and I wrote another letter to him, uh, to Vance, and I said, here's what he said and all of that. I put that in the denial of justice book. I appealed it. I filed a Freedom of Information Act. I did everything I possibly could, and they would never come back to um, investigating. I then went to the Attorney General of the State of New York and uh, tried to get them to look into it, and they didn't. And so now I've come up with another angle that I think might work, because I'm not going to give up on it. But it really was disturbing, because, uh, you know, she still hasn't gotten that full investigation that I want. That's all I ask is for them to do a thorough investigation of her death. And I don't know if that's going to happen, but I'm going to keep trying.